I don't know what to say to you. I really don't. This is the Sabbath of the Lord, and I don't know what to say to you. But I'll say it anyway. Some people ask me how Francois and I got together. Some people want to know how do we work together? We're so different. We're like chalk and cheese, aren't we? You know, psychology says that you have to be compatible. And they do compatibility tests. And they say your interests do not coincide. You will never hit it or find someone else. But God says, I'll put opposites together. Because how else am I going to rub the rough edges off you? And so by his grace, he gives me my dear wife, who says, if the congregation could see you now, <laughs> and then he kindles that, you know, that affectionate feeling so that you can't stay cross forever. And God is good. He puts all these opposites together. And Francois always says, Walter, you knock them over, I pick them up. And some people call me a conspiracy theorist. You haven't heard that, have you? You know, there's a difference between the interpretation of prophecy using the Bible and the spirit of prophecy as a guideline and conspiracy. There are lots of conspiracy theorists in the world. I like to call myself a conspiracy factualist. Now, Francois deals in rocks and inscriptions. They're pretty solid. But when it comes to putting prophecy together, that's a different story. And the only tool in your toolbox is the Bible. The Bible and the Bible alone. And the spirit of prophecy, of course, supports the Bible. And when it comes to conspiracies, you go and look it up in the spirit of prophecy. Type in the word into the search engine, secret societies get hundreds of hits with great detail of what God showed and all the things that were happening. Some people say to me, this has nothing to do with the scriptures, has nothing to do with the Bible. I type it into the search engine and I wrestle with myself and then it says, that the revelation gave, given to John will teach God's people to steer clear of secret societies. Oops! Does the revelation of John have something to do with secret societies then? You know, that's what keeps me going. And... He has the habit of never taking the easy road, as we show. I mean, why should we take the easy one if we can take the hard one? Why should things go right on the screen if they can go wrong? And that's what life is all about. But I don't want to talk to you about any of those things today. I want to talk to you about our faith. Aren't we Seventh-day Adventists? Or are we part of an ecumenical, evangelical soup? Did you say no, brother? Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes to no. <laughs> Ethics and evolution. It's got nothing to do with my lecture. It's just a little background. It's not even a lecture. It's a sermon. It's not even a sermon. 
we want to chat because we are Seventh Day Adventists. I know there are many guests out there who might not be Seventh Day Adventists, but believe me, you are Seventh Day Adventists. You just don't know it yet. Amen. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse that's a powerful verse isn't it if you see the things of nature you really are without excuse if you think you come from a rock actually we do come from a rock it's just the rock of ages Former humanist of the year, Sir Julian Huxley, said, Humanism's keynote, the central concept to which all its details are related, is evolution. But evolution is without morality. There's no morality in evolution, only survival of the fattest. I mean, fittest. <laughs> There's no morality in that. And if that is the law, then trampling on the person next to you is the modus operandi of getting there. Because that's what you are, that's where you come from. And today, don't expect any help from the religious world. Forget it. You'll get no help on this issue. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the sea, the earth, and the springs of water. Forget it. Pope gives blessing to the evolutionary theory. New knowledge led him to officially announce the Vatican's acceptance of evolutionary theory as more than a hypothesis. Quote, more than the theory of evolution, it is appropriate to speak of the theories of evolution. And the Protestant denominations of the world, they have capitulated one after the other. And their synods have its decided in favor. Journalgazette.net, Methodists advocates evolution, local layman key in changing denominations policy. Ford Wayne Mann says he has finally nudged the United Methodist Church into the 21st century on the subject of evolution. Finally! In 2008, the Quadrennial National Conference decided that's the way to go. Please, I'm not here knocking the other religions. I'm just stating a fact. It's just a fact. Don't expect any help from those who are supposed to be the standard bearers of an ethics based on the Word. Don't expect any help. Churches promoting evolution. At last count, 612 churches promoted evolution on Evolution Sunday, which became Evolution Weekend, as close as possible to the birthday of Charles Darwin. Now again, I'm not knocking any of these people because I understand their mindset. I was there. I was an atheist. I thought like this man. I thought like Richard Dawkins. He's a member of the Brights. To be a member of the Brights, you have to deny the existence of God. It's a prerequisite. It's astounding to me that Protestant, Roman Catholic, Buddhist, Wiccan, all kinds of organizations can be brights. And so you have preachers standing on pulpits, even in Protestant denominations, that deny the existence of God. But they are preaching an ethic. And the ethic doesn't come from the theory of evolution. This author wrote this famous work, The God Delusion, in which he appropriates 
every single negative adjective in the Oxford Dictionary and applies it to God. I'm not even going to put the quote up. You've probably seen it. It's horrendous. And what does he remind me of? Me. He reminds me of me. Ask my wife. Atheist. I used to mock Christianity. I hated God. Most of you who have seen my testimony will know why I hated God. I didn't hate God because of the Bible or the Word of God. I hated God because of theology. The theologians made me hate God because they distorted the doctrines of the Bible and turned God into a megalomaniac monster who wanted to do nothing else than torture people for all eternity, preferably on 50 Bunsen burners burning at the same time. I was a Roman Catholic. I was raised Roman Catholic. If I said enough penance, he might remove one bun Bunsen burner during purgatory. But even if I made it to heaven, I would still have to sit a couple of thousand years to burn away the consequences of my ill deeds. I didn't have time for such a God. I hated him. And he was willing to put my mother into hell for all eternity for being something different to what they were. And I used to stand in front of the television and I used to watch the religious programs and I used to laugh like a drain all these morons with their crutches trying to get their way to a better place. So thank you Richard Dawkins. I understand how you think. This is the evolutionist. Now, I'm trying to make a point here. I'm not knocking him. I'm saying I was like he was. Richard Dawkins, let's see what he has to say. What is the purpose of life? Already has a straightforward Darwinian answer and is quite different from what would be a worthwhile purpose for me to adopt in my own life. Indeed, my own philosophy of life begins with an explicit rejection of Darwinism, this is an evolutionist speaking, as a normative principle for living even while I extol it as the explanatory principle for life. He says, I believe in evolution. I believe I came into existence through evolution. He has no choice because there's no God. But I cannot use evolution to define the principles which make me human because there's no ethic in evolution. So he continues, this brings me to the aspect of humanism that resonates most harmoniously for me. We are on our own in the universe. Humanity can expect no help from outside, so our help, such as it is, must come from our own resources. As individuals, we should make the most of the short time we have, for it is a privilege to be here. We should seize the opportunity presented by our good fortune and fill our brief minds before we die with understanding of why and where we exist. He cannot use evolution, so he has to use another ethic. And that ethic is humanism. And humanism, by definition, is godless. Richard Weikert writes a book from Darwin to Hitler. And the review says, this is one of the finest examples of intellectual history I have seen in a long while. It is insightful, thoughtful, informative, and highly readable. Rather than simply connecting the dots, so to speak, the author provides a sophisticated and nuanced examination of numerous German thinkers of the late 19th and early 20th century who were influenced to one degree or another by Darwinist naturalism and their ideas. I'm allowed to say this. 
I am from German stock. <laughs> and it was perfectly in order to define yourself as Aryan. I always say to my wife, who comes from Africa, and therefore has largely European blood, mixed with a few drops of non-European blood. And there's a book written by a fellow called Hirsa in which he follows all these European immigrants and determines how much foreign blood there is in those veins. And if I read my wife's genealogy in that book, she has about 8%. I'm Aryan, zero percent. I'm pure stock. My poor kids now have four <laughs> percent. On the basis of that four percent, she should be considerably inferior to me by definition. Interesting, eh? So Darwinism has influenced genocide. I'm just pointing this out because Richard Dawkins, when he applies all these adjectives to God, is saying that religion is the cause of the misery on the planet. Well, here is a non-religious reason for some misery on the planet. S Cecil John Rhodes, the Rhodes Legacy. It was Cecil Rhodes, the founder of the international diamond industry of Rhodesia, the premier of the Cape, the lawgiver, the Glen Gray Act of Rhodesia, the world statesman, confident of the Queen Victoria and Kaiser Wilhelm, the one who in his, in his last will and testament brought about the Rhodes Scholarship, of which Bill Clinton was a recipient to instill certain ideas into the minds of the great leaders of the world. And what did he say? Who endowed and set up the Rhodes Scholarship of his seventh will for the purpose of uniting the United States with Great Britain. Rhodes felt that there were too few Britons, as too little of the globe was British territory, if we had retained America, there would be millions more of English living. We are the finest race in the world, and the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for the human race. Wars would end too. Isn't that fascinating? Here I'm a German, I say, hey, I'm an Aryan stock. Numero uno. Here comes Rhodes and says, no, you've got to be a Brit to be numero uno. Fascinating. You know, in South Africa, the Africana always gets the blame for apartheid. No, the Africana perfected apartheid, for which he needs a lashing, which he has received, but who actually thought of the idea? The British. They just didn't coin a phrase. They didn't give it a name. You know, when you look at films like Gandhi, you see Gandhi was thrown off the train in the 1940s under an apartheid structure. Have you seen anyone seen that film? Do you remember he was thrown off the train? Who was ruling in the 1940s in southern Africa? Was it the Afrikaner? No. It was the British. Who was controlling India and causing all that chaos over there and deciding that certain groups were just not viable or not fit to rule? It was the British. I'm not knocking the British. I'm just telling you about mindsets. Don't get angry with me. The Afrikaner only took over in 1962. So he didn't invent apartheid, he just perfected it. Doesn't make it right. So 
well, are the Germans the greatest nation or are the Britons the greatest nation? Aborigines, is it altruism or fear of losing their marbles? To the museum, the collection is an incomparable scientific asset. What museum? All the museums of the world. What are in these museums? The skulls and the bones of the Aborigines. The question is, who is right? European and British museums are believed to hold thousands of Aboriginal bones, hair and soft tissues, removed or stolen from Australia as recently as the 1940s. Did you know that as recently as the 1940s, you could get permission from the British High Commissioners to go and kill yourself an Aborigine? Why? Because they were steeped in evolutionary thinking. Just looking at an aborigine must tell you that he must be of some primitive nature. And today they are professors in the universities. Amazing how rapid evolution can advance. Fascinating. If you look at the Natural History Museums and Cambridge University, holds 448 ab Aboriginal remains, including names of known individuals such as King Billy, tribal leader from the north of Queensland. Well, these are just facts. Or let's go to joining religion with these concepts. And you take uh, Herbert W. Armstrong, the founder of the Worldwide Church of God. Daniel wrote in and after the time of the Chaldean king Nebuchadnezzar's invasion and captivity of the kingdom of Judah. But the kingdom of Israel had long before been invaded, conquered, and its people moved out of Palestine. Where did these people move to? They moved to Britain. Fascinating. Do you know what these people come up with? Oh, oh, and Jeremiah. Jeremiah took the stone that Jacob had his head on. And he took it to England. Well, actually to Scotland. And today, the Queen's posterior is on the stone when she is inaugurated. And soon maybe Prince Charles will have his royal posterior on the stone. I don't know. But these are the Israelite remnants. These are the people of the promise. These are the people that will inherit the kingdom. And so you have to be British or from the United States in order to qualify for heaven. There's a religious system. Well, some of the Afrikaners perfected apartheid. Here is Nieser's book, and the origin and history and destiny of the white race. He says, no, 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 it's not just the Britons, it's all the European nations. And they migrated to Africa, so only the white Africans go to heaven. The others don't qualify as humanity. It gets pretty rough. Eh? Don't qualify as humanity. So therefore they can be safely dispatched with. That's like Hitler thought. That's like the British thought in terms of the Aborigines. So we cannot isolate one particular nation and say there's the pariah of the world. We all have pariah within us. I thought it was perfectly acceptable to murder every single creature that came past me as an evolutionist. Cold-bloodedly. Why? Because it was just a product of the slime pit. And so a religious system emerges. What is truth? Pilate said unto him, what is truth? And then he doesn't wait for the answer. He walks off. What a silly man. 
And when he had said this, he went out again in, unto the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. The only one without fault is Jesus Christ. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The great definitions of truth in the Bible. Or John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So what is truth? Jesus is the truth. The Word is the truth. Psalms 119, verse 151, Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. Or parallel text, the righteousness, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is truth. Those are the great definitions of truth. I will not find truth in any other ethic than in the Bible, in Christ, and in his law. There is no other truth. That's the biblical solution. H.G. Wells, the well-known science fiction writer and historian, and Fabian Socialist wrote, if all animals and man had been evolved in this ascendant manner, then there had been no first parent, no Eden, and no fall. Is that logical? Absolutely. And if there had been no fall, then the entire historical fabric of Christianity, the story of the first sin, and the reason for the atonement upon which current teaching-based Christian emotion and morality just collapses like a house of cards. If evolution is right, there's no need for an atonement. The order of God versus the order of Gaia. Now remember Richard Dawkins says the only morality that he can envision lies in humanism because he has no other choice, because there is no God. We come from evolution. Let's see where it leads. Genesis 1 verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that creepeth or moveth upon the earth. Now according to Jones Vian, James Lovelock formulated the Gaia hypothesis, which today is known as the worship of the earth propagates holism, which perverts and inverts Genesis 1. Holism is evolution at its finest. Man evolves to the point where he's equal with the earth. There's no God, so the highest you can go is the earth. Welcome to being a rock. Maybe you can advance to the level of the plant or the animals. Isn't that incredible? But God says, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him, male and female created him. For I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. We have these two tremendous opposite philosophies in the world. And my feet have been firmly entrenched in both of them. So I'm not knocking them, the one or the other. I'm just giving you the facts. The United Nations Conference on the Environment Development, UNCET, also called the Earth Summit, was an unveiling of the philosophical shift from the Judeo-Christian worldview to Gaia. The program of action called Agenda 21 is 297 pages long and a second related document, Global Assessment, over 1,000 page, pages long. And together these documents contain an agenda that can only be called evil as the implementation of the action items will turn freedom into bondage and life into misery as all of what we know today will be replaced with a planned electronic society in which our only value will be to produce. 
That's what evolution says. In feudalistic times, only the king and nobility owned land and had freedom. So too, under the United Nations rule, feudalistic times will return and the light of freedom will go out with the adoption of sustainable development at onset, man was demoted to the same level as a plant or an animal. Human philosophy always ends at the end of this line. Whether there's an Adolf Hitler ruling, it comes to a sticky end at some point. Whether it is apartheid regimes, whether it is mega race philosophy, it will come to a sticky end. But we have gone from the national to the international. We are now at United Nations level. The world is going to experience its final cataclysm based on humanism. The Earth Charter is a declaration of the fundamental principles for building a just, sustainable, and peaceful global society for the 21st century. Prepare yourself for having to write a report when you use a strip of toilet paper. Created by global civil society, endorsed by thousands of organizations and institutions, the Charter is not only a call to action, but a motivating force inspiring change the world over. And Morris Strong was the Secretary General of the historic United Nations Unset Earth Conference, and he said, the real goal of the Earth Charter is that it will in fact become like the Ten Commandments. We have another morality on the planet. Would you agree? So there are two moralities. The one based on humanism and the other one based on scripture. And the choice will come to each and every one of us. Which one? Mikhail Gorbachev said, do not do unto the environment of others what you do not want done to your own environment. My hope is that this charter will be a kind of Ten Commandments. Second one, a sermon on the mount. Oops. That provides a guide for human behavior towards the environment in the next century. So the earth becomes God because there is no other God. And may the earth help you in the final analysis. But personally, I think your chances are zip. The Humanist Manifesto states, in order that religious humanism may be better understood, we, the undersigned, desire to make certain affirmations which we believe the facts of our contemporary life demonstrate. We therefore affirm the following. Religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. And humanism believes that man is a part of nature and that he has emerged as a result of a continuous process, which is evolution, which is pantheism. I've sat in committees in our own ranks where I've heard these pantheistic ideas. If you're an evolutionist, you're a pantheist. Bottom line, what are you doing in the church? If you want to be a pantheist, then be a pantheist. If you want to be here in the Seventh-day Adventist church, then believe God. Man is at last becoming aware that he is alone that he alone is responsible for the realization of the world, of his dreams, that he has within himself the power for its achievement, he must set intelligence and will to the task. We're going to save ourselves. We're going to save ourselves. For this great achievement, man utilizing the resources and the laws of nature, yet without divine aid, can take full credit Similarly, similarly, for his shortcomings, he must take full responsibility. Humanism assigns to man nothing less than the task of being his own savior and redeemer. It's pretty straightforward. That's where you have to go. 
How can you even think of compromising humanism and, and religion? Isn't that a blend that is totally incompatible? So how can you even imagine theistic evolution, which is a, sim a similar blend of what is happening? The Bible says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, I was an atheist, as you know. And today, I am a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Why do I emphasize that so, you know? Why don't I just say, I'm an Adventist? I did that. The rector of my university, when I was experienced the change in my life, called me in and he said, uh, uh, who has the truth? After a long discussion where I said I cannot reconcile the evolutionary concept that I have to teach with what I now believe, he asked this question, who has the truth? And I said, uh, well, I think it's in the Bible. He said, I didn't ask you, said I said, who has the truth? And I said, well, uh, well, Christianity, and he says, no, I didn't ask you that. I said, who has the truth? And I said, oh, it was the seventh Adventist. <laughs> and I thought I was going to be lambasted. And he said, well, thank you very much. I wish you all the best in your future. I was out of there. No. Today I say, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I'm a Christian. Why? Because Christianity is the only religion on the planet that gives a reason for the state and the mess that we are in. The only religion. And it is the only religion on the planet that gives a solution for the mess we are in. If you go to any other religion, salvation is by your own effort. And why you got into your mess in the first place is totally unclear. And God has totally divorced himself from the process, sits up there and watches us like insects to see which one he's going to squash next. This is just the way it is. But Christianity has a God who is involved. A God who didn't take sin lightly, but bore the consequences in his own body. Who identified to such an extent with my situation that he came and took it unto himself. Isn't that correct? And my death can only be reversed by his life. So here is a logical progression. If I then take prophecy and all the other revealed words, because thy word is truth, then this adds to the scale. Because there is no other religious writing on the planet that accurately tells the future from the beginning to the end. Only the Bible does that. So I can take this and I can add it to my scale. And I could look at fulfilled prophecy in the past to gain confidence in prophecy which is still unfold. Isn't that correct? Unfulfilled. So the evidence mounts. And then the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So if I start living this life and walking this walk with God, I experience something which is phenomenal. Now, I want to talk to you as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Because I'm not just a normal Christian, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. 
And why am I a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? To all you non-Seventh-day Adventists sitting here, I'm not pushing my denomination and saying, look, this denomination is the bee's knees. No, it's pathetic. <laughs> and if it weren't pathetic and miserable and blind and na naked and wretched, I would have to leave this denomination to find one that is pathetic. Because that's the biblical criterion, isn't that right? So I'm not pushing Seventh-day Adventists, and as I said yesterday, I'm an Adventist, not because, but in spite of Seventh-day Adventists. I'm not here for any other reason than there is nowhere else to go. Where shall I go? They have the words of eternal life. Do you know how much confusion there is out there in the world? You know, it says here in the Word of God that uh, we have to search for it as for a hidden treasure. Isn't that right? We are to educate our children in the truths found in the Word of God. It is an inexhaustible treasure. But men fail to find this treasure because they do not search until it is within their possession. So the Bible says we have to search in this field. And when we search and we find the treasure, we have to go and sell how much? All. Now there's something which I would like to call the blessed curse of having been born a Seventh-day Adventist. What a blessing to be born a Seventh-day Adventist. How often my wife and I have shed tears because we weren't born Seventh-day Adventists. To raise our children without God in total darkness. To an age when they can even decide for themselves. What a blessing to be born a Seventh-day Adventist. And what a curse. Because it cost you nothing. You got it for nothing. You were born with it. It was in your lap when you were born. And something only has value if you pay a price for it. It's just part of human nature. And I had to pay a price. And my wife had to pay a price. I lost every single friend I had. I lost every single family member that I had. I lost my job. I lost everything to gain the treasure. And it was cheap. It was cheap, but it was painful. And you've gotten it for nothing. And so maybe many Seventh-day Adventists don't value what they have because they never paid the price. And so when the young people leave and they go out there and their lives become a mess, I'm so grateful that we serve a God who runs after the children to the thousandth generation. Because they have to make this faith their own. You can't just accept it from your mother or your father. You have to make it your own. Wow. I agree. There is no spiritual gain without toll. Do you ask, what shall I do to be saved? I'm quoting from a very good source. You must lay your preconceived opinions, your hereditary and cultivated ideas at the door of investigation. If you search the scriptures to vindicate your own opinions, you will never reach the truth. 
And we have people in our ranks who are trying to vindicate their opinions, but they are not willing to sacrifice them at the altar and let God's opinion take over. Search in order to learn what the Lord says. If conviction comes as you search, if you see your cherished opinions are not in harmony with the truth, do not misinterpret the truth in order to suit your own belief, but accept the light given. Open mind and heart that you may behold the wondrous things out of the word of God. For in Christ, as the world's Redeemer calls for an acknowledgement of the enlightened intellect controlled by the heart that can discern and appreciate the heavenly treasure, this faith is inseparable from repentance and transformation of character. If the Word of God doesn't change me, I haven't got it. If my character is not honed and corrected, I haven't got it. If I don't come back into harmony with the law of God, I haven't got it. I need the transforming power of God. And this gospel is free, but it costs everything you have, including your self-esteem. I know that there are mega preachers out there who say that self-esteem is what it's all about. But justification is laying man's glory in the dust. Now, why am I a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? My mother was a Lutheran. Why didn't I become a Lutheran? I would have liked to become a Lutheran, it would have been a lot easier. Or why didn't I become a Methodist? I would have liked to be a Methodist. It would have been a lot easier. I had the Methodist minister in my house. And I asked him a few questions, you know, about the Antichrist and Daniel and their doctrines and their beliefs. And eventually he got up and he closed his elder's ears and marched his elder out of my house. I was not a Seventh-day Adventist yet. I was just asking some questions. And I was asking questions for a reason. Why are you Seventh-day Adventists and not just any other denomination? Because your task is to set the record straight on the character of God. That's your task. I was an atheist because of theology. The theology said my Protestant mother was going to go to hell because she didn't have the right religion. And God became a monster. No, the church should have become the monster. But that's not how humans think. God became the monster. And when I discovered, searching the Bible, that God is not a monster, but God hates sin. And God said, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Though your sins are like scarlet, I'll make them whiter than snow, whiter than wool. He doesn't want that. Anyone should be lost. Doesn't the Bible say that? But if I cling to sin, then I will be destroyed together with the sin that I cling to. He's not a monster. He doesn't hate me. He died for me. But he hates sin because sin is so destructive. And then you have the religious world out there teaching the immortality of the soul. Good grief. Apply your logical mind and ask yourself, if I am immortal, even in a non-physical state, even as Casper, 
if I am immortal, then what point was there in God dying for me that I may have eternal life? Save yourself the bother, I'm immortal. The whole doctrine of atonement and salvation in Christ is destroyed by the doctrine of immortality. Who teaches the mortality of the soul? The Seventh-day Adventists. Oh, the Jehovah's Witnesses teach it too. But they don't have Christ. They have him as a man, but they don't have him as God. If he doesn't have divinity in himself, then he cannot have life within himself. So who picked him up by his bootstraps when he was dead? If Christ isn't God, I am dead in my transgression. So the only doctrine that makes sense and is in harmony with the Bible is the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine on the immortality of the soul. So logically, I'm in harmony there with the Seventh-day Adventists. How am I saved? How am I saved? I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. When I was a Roman Catholic, I could recite the Hail Mary like that. I still can. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Jesus, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for sinners now on the earth. Amen. If you're in a hurry, you've got to be able to say it fast. <laughs> Analyze that prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with you. There's only one translation that translates it like that. And that's the Douay version. That's the Jesuit version. Wow. The other versions normally revolve around you are highly esteemed. You have found favor. In other words, Protestantism teaches that Mary, just like one of us, found grace with God. But the Douay version translates it, she is full of grace. If she is full of grace, then she is the receptacle and the dispenser of grace. Enter another doctrine, the Immaculate Conception. You know, it's so well phrased. You believe that the Immaculate Conception refers to Christ who was born from her. No. She was the Immaculate Conception. By a miracle of God, God kept her from the ravages and the consequences of sin. She was born sinless. Wow. Now, just hold it a moment there. You and I are born sinful, according to the doctrine. In fact, we inherit the sin, according to Catholic doctrine, of Adam and Eve, called original sin. That's contrary to the Word of God, which says that the children cannot inherit the sins of the parents and cannot be punished from them. But if I logically work this one through, why must I die then? I had nothing to do with Adam and Eve's sin. Then I have to come to the conclusion that what I inherited from Adam and Eve is not their sin, but their sinful nature. Because Adam and Eve cannot give me what is not theirs to give. And if they had lost eternal life, they couldn't pass it on to their posterity. And if they had lost the innocent nature, they cannot pass it on to their posterity. And therefore, I sit with it. And I'm born dead. How do I get life? 
I can only get it through Jesus Christ, the life giver, who is willing to die so that I can inherit his perfect imputed righteousness, his sinless character. Isn't that incredible? So Catholicism teaches here was a miracle and Mary was conceived immaculate. Well, if God could do it for Mary, couldn't he have done it for me? Or for you? Then why bother sending his son? There goes the gospel. And if he did it for Mary, and she is now full of grace, well then, why do I need the Son of God? I can go to Mary and say, give me your grace. Oh, and she will so kindly dispense it. Does it make a mockery of the gospel, yes or no? And yet we have people within our own ranks who want to embrace Catholicism as a partner. What has light and darkness got in common? What has the gospel of Jesus Christ and the gospel of self got in common? Martin Luther said, if you do not contend with your whole heart against the impious government of the Pope, you cannot be saved. I'm harsh, huh? But that's where I come from. I apologize to Roman Catholics here, but what they teach is not biblical. I was a Roman Catholic. I was an atheist. Grace without law. The law has been done away with. Who teaches that? Everybody out there. All right, they get rid of Mary, but they, now they get rid of the law. Good grief, that must be the oxymoron of the millennia. Why? Because if I receive grace, then I must be a transgressor. Without law, there is no transgression. Does Paul say that, yes or no? Without law, there is no transgression. Where there is no transgression, there can be no consequence of that transgression, and therefore no need for grace. So whoever teaches law without, or grace without law, misses the gospel. If there's grace, there has to be law. More than that. There has to be a transgressed law. And who's the transgressor? Me. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, rather than preaching self-esteem, I have to accept that I am a sinner. Blessed are the poor in spirit said Jesus. I have to re realize my poverty. Who teaches that? One denomination on the planet and one only. Who's that? Seventh day Adventists. Predestination. Who teaches that? Calvinism. And then in its modern form, dispensational predestination, if you like. Who teaches that? The entire evangelical world. Good grief. Good grief. I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying Satan is a brilliant strategist. He will do everything in his power to embrace the name Jesus while he subtly dispenses him to the sideline. In Catholicism, he puts Mary in his place. And in dispensational theology, he puts race in his place. I am saved by my genealogy. As many say, if you now take the black Hebrew movement or 
the super white race movement or whichever it is, or the Rastafarian movement, which says only black people go to heaven. I don't understand how white people can become Rastafarians. They must be brain dead. Jesus is sidelined. Now what does this doctrine teach? That all the prophecies of the Bible don't really pertain to us or to Christianity. We will be raptured away. It only applies to the heritage of Israel. We will be raptured away. And they will create a beautiful new Jerusalem where Christ will reign for a thousand years. The very present one and the golden gate will open up and all the dead that lie around there and are they paying $60,000 for a little grave site so that you can be the first in through the golden gate with the Messiah. And everybody else is lost. And you had the dispensation of law. And if you transgress the law, sizzle fits. <laughs> Dead. And now you have dispensation of grace. You do the same transgression. Here you're saved by grace. Don't worry about it. And in the resurrection, if I was the Jew... And God said, you are the transgressor, you transgressed my law, you were under the dispensation of the law, you're going to die again. <laughs> but you, you've done the same thing, you're under grace. What would I say to God? I would say to him, you are an arbitrary monster. You have two scales, two sets of criteria, one for A and another for B. Where's your consistency? Does this play havoc with the character of God, yes or no? Absolutely. It's a total nightmare out there. But my Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Jew was saved by the blood of the Lamb. He had to confess his sins over the Lamb and he had to slaughter that lamb and watch the blood drain and in type take hold of the righteousness of Christ. That's how he was saved. That's how Adam and Eve were saved. That's how their posterity can be saved. Every single one. Who teaches that? The Seventh-day Adventist Church. And if the Seventh-day Adventist church teaches that the law cannot be compromised, how much of the law does that entail? 5%, 10%, 90%. All of it. And what does the Sabbath stand for? The Sabbath stands for where I come from and where I am saved and atoned for by the same deity, the one who created me is the one who loved me to the point of death. If I dispense with the Sabbath, I dispense with his authority. If I do not embrace the Sabbath, I embrace another deity. If I embrace the Sabbath, can I at the same time embrace evolution, yes or no? No. And if you want to embrace them both, then what are you doing in the Seventh-day Adventist church? Create yourself your own church. But don't call it Seventh-day Adventist church. We have this notion that we can change our name. Christian Evening Coffee Drinking Fellowship Church. I've seen names like that. I'm not even joking. Well, what's this? That's our church. Or let your hair down church with a big painting of a guy on a surfboard with his hair flying. And what's that? No, that's our church. Excuse me. Why doesn't it say there Seventh-day Adventist Church? 
What are we so scared of? About our doctrines? This is the only church on the entire planet that can defend its doctrines on a public platform. There is no other denomination that can do it, and that's why they never do. Why, if we hold public campaigns, do the preachers and the ministers not come to the meetings to openly confront what is being said? Why do they have to do it from behind? Because they cannot bring a thus says the word. When we were coming into the church, somebody gave me a document against the Sabbath, and I wasn't even talking about becoming a Seventh-day Adventist member. I didn't have time to read it, so I gave it to my wife. Don't underestimate my wife. Everybody said to her, Oh, why are you being baptized? Aren't you just following your husband? No, she was ahead of me. She was ahead of me on the Sabbath. She was ahead of me on the health message. She was ahead of me on most things. Don't underestimate a woman. But she never gets the credit for it. <laughs> and she received this document. And the document was against the Seventh-day Sabbath. And it was a thick document, and she went through the whole document with her Bible and decided at the end of it that the Seventh-day Sabbath was right. Amen. So don't underestimate documents against the Sabbath. Leave them there. Why does God allow apostasy within the Seventh-day Adventist church? He allows apostasy to create a shaking. And he allows apostasy to ripen to the point when even a, a little child will be able to distinguish between the two aspects. I don't want to go into all the other reasons and doctrines. There are hundreds of them. And if you look into the logic of it all, you finally come to the point where you say, Lord, I have no choice. I have to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. What about Ellen White? <laughs> you haven't heard that one yet, eh? It's brand new. Well, do a Bible study and see that the remnant will have a prophet. The spirit of prophecy is one of the features of the final movement. If God used the prophet in the Exodus movement, how much more so in the antitypical Exodus movement? If God led Moses to the borders of Canaan and he couldn't enter because of whatever he did, the antitype will do the same. 1888, they didn't enter. They had to go back, and she didn't enter. If God chose Moses to give him a health message, wouldn't the antitypical prophet receive a health message of even greater import? We can go through these parallels one after the other. If this church doesn't have a prophet, then please leave it and find one that has a prophet that is biblical. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian because I don't have a choice. Job said, But where shall wisdom be found and where is the place of understanding? Man does not know the price of it, nor is it found in the land of the living. The deep says it is not in me, and the sea says it is not in me. Pure gold cannot be given in its stead, and silver be weighed as its price. It cannot be weighed against the gold of a fear, against precious onyx or sapphire. Gold and the crystal cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for a vessel of fine gold. 
No mention shall be made of coral or of pearls, or the price of wisdom is above rubies. rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it. It cannot be weighed against pure gold. From where then does wisdom come, and where is the place of understanding? Doesn't Daniel say that at the end there will be a people with understanding? Yea, it is hidden from the eyes of all living and hidden from the birds of heaven. The place of ruin and death say we have heard the fame of it with our ears. God understands the way of it and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and he sees under all the heavens making a weight for the winds and measuring out the waters by measure. When he makes a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning to the thunder, then he saw it and he declared it, he prepared it, yea, and searched it out. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And depart from evil is understanding. Who teaches that? The Seventh-day Adventists. I don't have a choice. I was dragged into the Seventh-day Adventist church first, feet first, kicking, biting, saying, I don't want to be part of these peculiar people. <laughs> Solomon said, If you cry after knowledge and lift up your head for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search her for for her as for hidden treasure, then you shall understand the fear of Jehovah and find the knowledge of God. For Jehovah gives wisdom out of his mouth, come knowledge and understanding. He lays up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is the shield of those who walk uprightly. He keeps the paths of judgment and guards the way of his saints. Then you shall understand righteousness and judgment and honesty, every good path. If you don't have a sanctuary message understanding, you cannot understand the plan of salvation. Who teaches that? The Seventh-day Adventists. I want to end with a prayer that Paul prayed. For this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages forever. Amen. Loretta, come and sing us a song. This is my friend's daughter.